see Moogie here going for a, a bit of a spawn peak. Oh, Moogie! What is that? Finds two onto Neo and Spaz. Atletico are going to hate themselves. And Moogie is going to be in disbelief. Could be possible for Irons, that's for sure. This is going to get open and Proto from above manages to take down no time. It's all going to be on VOD and Cloud at the moment. VOD searching for the planner. Cloud manages to find a row, but that's not the planner, and the bomb should go down at the moment. It does. It's all on Cloud, who gets found by Proto. Proto doing beautiful stuff for his team there, and evening it out to 2 2. From the east, and Nierge will be triggering the very f uh, the first um, Grismop mine. Oba securing the kill on Kennedy. That's Ella down, and one of the aggressive Roma is gone. Oba is certainly now paying more attention towards the generous closet as that will be breached and knights will be caught off guard and Oba will be securing a second kill on castle making it a 3v5 situation LeBron will be potentially forced out and will be caught off guard with that ash charge as that wall was not fully reinforced and what ended up being a double-edged sword for anthrax Oba going for a very aggressive push at peekaboo and will be sec um, securing that final kill. This around manages to spot them out and he's gonna back off there. Magnet finds out Fletch, he's looking for the second. Magnet finds Warden, could this really be possible right now? They're just gonna wait it out. Magnet goes for the defuse. Rizraz getting ready to run around here and he should be the person that denies this. Oh, no way is this gonna be possible. Magnet in a 1v1 clutch situation here against Jack Daddy. He has managed to, it's actually a 1v2, sorry. Magnet finds Jack Daddy, oh my god, that was so close. That was so close there. Clutch has been tagged quite heavy. Lusty's come around to replace Aces in taking. Oh no, right as I say that. Wildman looking to prove me wrong as he finds Magnet. He finds Lusty Wildman going massive at the moment. It's a 3v2 with 25 seconds on the clock. Kings, however, manages to find a kill over onto Rizraz as he's made his way into dining. Being careful of above at the moment, Fletch has been tagged heavy. We're now at 16 seconds on the clock, what's going to happen? It's now a 2v2, Fletch has been tagged heavy, Pun coming above, looking to drop the hatch. He's going to be pre-firing, looking for Wildman, and Wildman finds Pun! Ladies and gentlemen, it's looking like Corviday will claim victorious on map number one. Wildman even manages to fight Kings after a beautiful 4k. Hello everyone and welcome to week two of the R6 ANZ podcast. Uh, we have a very special uh, opportunity this time. We have with us um, hosting myself, Dev Marta Cthulhu, uh, and Sky. Hey. Hey. And we have special guests from Mind Freak and Corviday, Corviday's own Rizraz. Hello Rizraz. Hello. And Mind Freak's Magnet. Magnet, how are you going? Pretty good. Well, so we're here, we made it to the podcast. <laughs> we got everything we got past all the tech issues and we actually got it happening yeah it's pretty cool stuff i think to start off we'll talk about that highlight video we just saw they made by killer scrubbies that was a uh, pretty interesting highlight video what are your thoughts on that i, I like the the last one the wild man clutch i thought it was pretty impressive yeah it's that was huh? that was some quality i mean um but the other one that i thought was pretty significant was one of magnet Magnet, you're almost clutch. Um, uh, definitely cafe. the thing was just sprinting around that last corner was definitely a no no what to do. Yeah. I think if I did not sprint I could have gotten Jaeger. Made it that one V one. Unfortunately I sprinted around though. Yeah, and as well if um I can't remember who was playing it, but if the Jaeger hadn't got revived by the mute, you would have had that in the bag anyhow. Easy. And in the and, bag. Yeah. And to finish it on a trade as well. It's kind of frustrating really. It definitely was. No, it was an awesome moment though. It's fantastic that you, the fact that you even managed to kill the the bandit. I think it was who was coming around the other side. He should have had you. It was Rizres. It was Rizres. Oh really? How do you how do you feel about that, Rizres? Uh, any other day I would have had him. <laughs> so so what if you, what if um what if you'd missed that shot, Rizres, and then the mag yeah magnet had managed to clutch that out? How how'd you feel? Um. Yeah, I probably would have felt pretty bad, but um, you know, with our team and whatnot, we we'd always look at bouncing back off that. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's the right kind of attitude you want to have. 
when you're at this level, the entire pro league scene is fairly new. We've just come from having the biggest thing that all these big teams have been playing has been CG, CG ladder for basically since the start of the scene. And then obviously we had Mind Freak head to um, Brazil. Uh, actually, where was it? it? Was Montreal for the invitation? Yeah. Um, so that was the other big thing that we had, but now the scene in its own independent way has actually started growing and we finally have this pro league and you want teams that are bouncing back. You don't want a team that's going to drop off the ladder after one match. It's not the point anymore. We're at a new level. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Obviously, um, adding pro league to the, to the scene, obviously there's been, um, a lot more controversy around it than probably what there should be. Um, but mm. you know, I, I think in the long run, I don't, don't think anyone can disagree that it is going to be um, a good move for Australia, um, New Zealand, and obviously the rest of the APAC uh, region. Yeah, yeah this, this, could, this could provide some um, good insight as well as the even potentially a meta change. Well, not at the start. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's going to happen. It's I'd a part say, of it. Um, yeah, EU, uh, US would be more heavy, like implying on the on the um, on the meta but yeah this there could be some good changes and i reckon that every, addition to of, of new regions and new players is always a good thing yeah mm. yeah keeping the keeping people players interested i mean when there's high stakes it means that people actually want to turn up and they want to play in these teams and want to dedicate the hours and hours of practice a week that are required in order to be the best in your region and the best in the world if that's what you're aiming for and the first step of interaction that we've got um, for our A and Z teams interacting with the rest of the world is this LAN that we've got coming up really soon. You guys, Magnet and Rizrez, you're both heading there, actually, of course. Yep, and, it's in, uh, I think, two weeks now. Yeah, and I'm, um, I'm really excited to be going as well. Um, what's, what was your first thought when you realized, holy crap, I'm actually going to go to LAN? I'm actually going to play against all these teams like Tide and like uh, all these other teams? Rizrez, you want to go first? Um, yeah, uh, our first thought, we were kind of, because we went to the ANZ Invitational in mm -hmm. Sydney, all of us were super excited to uh, go back again, like to be back to back, going back to Sydney again. And then it kind of hit us that, you know, we're going to be playing the Asian teams, and uh, all of us kind of like buckled down and started studying how they play, because uh, we're confident against them, we, we scrim them a lot. But it's definitely going to be a challenge to play against Asian teams. It's going to be something new. Yeah, I mean that's what you'd expect when the different regions mix. That's what no one expected to happen in season one of, of this year. At when finally Latin America came into the international pro league and they wiped the floor with all of the North American teams. And it's this is complete disruption. I'm really interested to see how that plays into your matches, both of you. In, uh, in the coming weeks versing all the Asian teams. Do you feel confident going into that? Uh, I'll say Corvide, definitely. Yeah, we yeah. feel confident going into it. You know, we've done our done our research and whatnot. We've, we've got a few notes taken down. Yeah, we're confident going in there. So as for your research, how do you actually do that? Is it one person in the team that watches the VODs and says, this is what I've learned, or do you each go individually? How does it work? Um, with us, we do it kind of as a team. Kata does it as a manager. He does it individually as well. He'll come back with notes. Wild comes back with notes. I'll come back with notes. And then, you know, together we'll, we either just give the notes or we all watch it again together and mm. then just pinpoint where those notes come from and so on and so forth. Right, so watching back your your scrims and your VODs, I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, especially the we watch the Asian ones specifically mm -hmm. a lot. So we, we study other teams of odds a lot more than we study our... Oh, own. okay. Interesting. Um, so which particular teams do you think you've had to study more because you think they're going to be a real challenge? Um, Tide. Yeah. Like, Tide's always, you know, they they used to be around here. I wasn't around, but I've, you know, heard stories that Tide used to just dominate everyone in ANZ. And... Um, it's kind of intimidated me a little bit, and mm. so I put a lot of study in on them specifically. Well, Cthulhu, you've casted a lot of Tide. Yeah, I um, actually wanted to um, w uh, ask you a question about that. What do you think about both uh, Tide's performance and uh, the performance of that second, of the second, second team, pardon me, Unique Monster, with uh, their 
kind of two distinct, you could say, uh, playstyles where Titus rather the kind of raw power and just skill where Unique Monster is rather more strat heavy. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't watched much of the uh, second team, but with if they're being strat heavy, we kind of have plans. We have a lot of plans for teams that are strat heavy, and uh, I think it's one thing that I like about our, our current team. Um, we also know that Tide is raw power, and uh, you know we have a lot of plans that are completely different. We, mm. we have like two separate plans for these two te uh, separate teams. For Tide specifically, um, yeah, we're aware of their raw power, and it that to us is a little bit more intimidating than the strat heavy huh. strat heavy teams. But um, yeah, either way, we're we're pretty much studied up. We've researched both uh, both of those play styles, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, um, both of the, the teams, the ANZ teams going to land, both Mindfreak and Corvidae have land experience, which, I mean, a lot of people would say that's kind of a, a big deal. You're talking about how you're feeling less comfortable going up against a team which is just so confident in their raw power, and you're going to have to sit up there on a stage and play in an environment that you're not familiar with. And having that land experience, do you really think that that's going to have a, an impact on how you perform at the land? Um... Yeah, that's one thing we said when we came back from the Invitational, you know, we had the, we, we did lose, unfortunately, but it's one thing that's we said, games. we told each other is, um, you know, we have this experience now, if we can go back again, we'll have that edge, and mm. uh, I guess that, that's built a lot of confidence in everyone in the team, knowing that we have that land experience going into this. It will not many of the, uh, as far as I understand, not many of the other APAC regions would have had necessarily as much land experience as you guys having the recent experience at um, at Sydney and uh, Mind Freak also managing to go. I mean, it was a long time ago. Mind Freak went to Montreal, but I mean, they have been to a land before. Whereas the APAC, uh, other regions in APAC might not have been. Yeah, see. Um, oh, yeah, you go. Nah, I, with, <laughs> with that fucking um, tired specifically, that's why yeah. uh, we're, we're studying them a lot more. We know they have that, that land experience and uh, mm. we're looking kind of just focused tunnel visioned on them because we feel like they're the biggest threat at the moment. So what happens if you come up first game and you're playing Unique Monster? And you're not playing tired and you haven't done all your research. You're just going to play, like, go back to your roots, you know what you do try and get the map downs on the maps that you want and just knuckle down or? Yeah, if we come against Unique Monster or anyone that isn't tired, you know, we'll put the study in on them specifically mm. and uh, we'll, we'll basically, yeah, go back to our roots and uh, knuckle down on them. Mm. I mean, and from what I've seen, that's... Yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, specifically with our team, um, at the moment it's only been... At the, now it's just pretty much Pun and Aces analysting now with land experience so it's going to be yeah sort of a learning curve for kings and i yeah i know that um the other boys will give us tips on um how to improve and whatnot but even just like the in ears how different they are compared to a real headset they really like change the way you play at land so i think it's just something to overcome quickly at land adapt and um hopefully uh play well mm. on land so have you considered uh, as for the in ears have you considered getting yourself a pair of in-ears and just pr training with them instead of using your actual headphones that you're comfortable with just so that there's yep. it's not as much shock and that's what you're doing is it that is exactly what we're doing we're fantastic doing as much practicing as possible but um when it does come to um come to like studying the teams just with our team um it's basically like every team is different like we'll make a full sort of um we make a, a full like word document on everything they can do, their defenses, their offenses, how we can counter, and all this, and it'll be for every single team. Um, even with the seeding, um, I know watching the Asian games, it doesn't really matter uh, who's first seed, who's second team, who's second seed, because all of the games for those playoffs, the seedings are so close, anyways. Mm. Which is why I think it'll be interesting because all these teams going to land right now are just are just top of um, of their region. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a question for both uh, Rizraz and Magnet. Did you guys expect to make land? Obviously, um, Corvidae already making previously at uh, the uh, ANZ finals, and then now 
uh, mind freak, I guess you guys had. Uh, well, you had a pretty good start, and then you sort of slowed down, and now, well, you've um, you've certainly, I think, improved a lot. Um, yeah, in the playoffs, you're doing fantastically. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Yeah. What um, are your what are your thoughts? For our team, coming up against uh, Corvette in our first matchup. We know they're a really strong team, we just didn't really have the confidence at the time, but Lusty, he's been uh, to overseas lands, he knows our potential, and he was really the, um, the driving factor behind our practice and our counter strating, um, especially Aces, um, to how we're going to face Corvette. And eventually, you know, we pulled through, managed to get the um, first win of the Pro League, which is awesome. Uh, oh. And at actually, Atletico... Unfortunately, they did lose Mud in that whole incident. Um, hmm. I think he was definitely a force to be reckoned with in the Pro League. He brought that team the aggression. So I hope I know Atletico find that fifth. And that's pretty much, I think, um, why we did so well against Atletico. What about you, Riz? Uh, with us, we were we were very confident going in. You know, with the whole making the Invitational, we had that kind of driving force, that motivation to get there again, and we were confident, we knew we could beat everyone that stands in front of us, but we didn't think it was going to be easy, we never thought it was going to be easy. We know Taboo and Atletico were two teams that are insanely strong, we, I'll be honest, I'll be honest, we underestimated Mind Freak a lot the <laughs> first time, and um, yeah, Mind Freak opened our eyes, and um, from that point on, we we buckled down on them, and uh, they've become a force against us. But with Taboo and Atletico, we kind of knew what we were doing against them, and uh, we were confident going into the Taboo match. And uh, I guess after the first map, <laughs> everyone's confidence kind of died down a little bit. Mm. And then uh, after the second, everyone's kind of shot straight back up yeah it was a really hard it was a hard fought victory but in the end it came down to the endurance and the positive attitude that you retain managed to retain that through the whole thing after you get it back um yeah just to resurrect because i definitely think um positive outlooks on whether you're losing or you're winning is just the best thing to do in a game like even aces in that like it was we were down man advantage on the last round against corvette um, everyone was still keeping comps up, no one was complaining, it's just constant call outs and then as soon as Aces got that 4k we were all just over the moon, it was just so great, just to win like that especially. Huh. Yeah, it was likewise with us on, um, on Oregon, the second map between us and Taboo. We lost, I think Border was the first map, we lost Border, which uh, everyone's motivation and everyone was kind of like down a little mm. bit, but you know, we, we picked each other back up and that last round of Oregon was like that that round everyone was back up on their feet and ready to go into the third map just because of the amount of adrenaline and uh hype that people bring like we were 5-5 five, five and uh the whole team Fletch, Warden were you know just motivating and trying to keep everyone happy and whatnot and when it came down to that one-on-one -on -one, uh I had Fletch in my ear, you know, just calming. Everyone was trying to stay quiet and stay uh, positive with it. And uh, when we did end up winning the second map, everyone was, you know, I, everyone was over the moon. We were ready to go into the third. Everyone was hyped up, ready to go. That's got to be the best feeling, keeping that positive attitude and having that complete trust in the person talking in your ear while you're in that such a stressful situation. Just... Yeah, I think it's something that's um, something that I love with yeah. our team right now like right now because of land especially our first land experience we have a lot of trust in each other mm. and each other's calls uh at land it was kind of you know it was kind of iffy everyone was new but after that you know it, we all trusted each other and um i really think that's what uh separates really good teams from average teams that trust that synergy that communication just everything fitting together perfectly and working out and keeping you cool when you lose a round or a match. Exactly. Um, I've got a quick question here. Um, I know we asked before, and you, I think you guys made pretty clear that um, Tide is one of those teams that 
you guys are sort of going to be on the lookout for and um, you guys uh, probably have prepared for that. Um, is there any other teams that you guys think, uh, I guess, pose a big threat to you, um, to you guys? Um, I'd say... I think it was Nor Nora Rengo. Hmm. Just also, just the general Korean playstyle is just so aggressive on their roaming and they do these really quick rotations, but... As it comes down to land, we're going to look at how they play, we're going to counter, we're just going to practice and dig in, because I know... Us and uh, Corviday and our team, they're going to come up with new things and really get ANZ to just destroy these Asian teams when we get there. You're dedicated for ANZ to be the ones going to the international, the, the finals, that's what oh, you yeah. want. It, it's, yeah, I'll be over the moon if we oh, just yeah? both make it to the finals. Can you promise that to all the ANZ fans? Can we just... Um, <laughs> I don't know about a promise, but uh, we'll try our best, we'll try our best. Okay, that's, I think that's what everyone wants to hear. And what do you think it would be like if you actually got asked to, to go overseas and go to the finals? Is that, is that the um, dream? That, that is def definitely definitely the dream. I think for every team that's gone there. Yeah. Like, you know, once once you're going, uh, what is it, Pro League Finals, Brazil, you know, that's just insane. You're travelling over there, it's just over the moon, you know? Mm. And it's something that has not been an option before in this scene in this region, ever. And that's Ap apart it's... from oh, you know, what, the invitation on Xbox. No, definitely not because yeah. PC was just such a smaller community before. Mm. But it's just growing so rapidly right now. Yeah, and it astounds me the way that esports scene, particularly our esports scene, how just how rapidly things change. We're growing and growing, and then suddenly you've got a pro league, and then it's growing and growing, and everything's frantic. And now we're going to LAN in Sydney, and then people might be going to LAN overseas. It's, there's so much happening all the time. There's so many people involved, and it's all just run on everyone's passion and everyone's frantically just keeping up with all these things. And it's just the rate of growth is amazing. Yep, and so it's all happening despite all the negative stuff from like you know the EU teams, the NA teams. Like we're here to prove something. Exactly. I would also like to add the question, um, out of sheer curiosity, with um, all of the not all of it, with uh, just flights to the lands. Do does the jet lag throw off a whole lot uh, with the performance-wise between the teammates, or were you guys, do you guys able to recover quickly from uh, from the flight and get back into the game, get back into the um, the pace? mindset, the mindset? Yeah. Um, for, the, for the ANZ Invitational, like the Sydney one, it wasn't too bad. The there wasn't much jet lag no one seemed to be kind of affected by it and you know, we all we got there and we all kind of just we rested we we hang out a little bit got to know each other but uh on a domestic level i think it didn't really have that much of an impact hmm. is what that you magnet um no uh, other than international i don't think you're really going to get um distracted by like two hour flights or whatnot like you're, you're focused, you're there to play, that's about it. So, right here we have the, like, we can actually say this now, these are the two top teams in ANZ, or as, in the ANZ Pro League, the teams that have come out in the top for the first season. This is as pro as we get in R6 ANZ. And what's it, what does it look like for you guys on a day-to-day, -day, a week-by-week -week basis in terms of, you know, your practice and, and how, how you put in your effort? You mentioned the researching before. What does it look like? like if someone was saying, like, I, I want to I be a pro league uh, player for R6 in ANZ, what does it actually look like to be that player? Um, Why don't you go yeah, first? Yeah, for me specifically, uh, you know, it, it, the studying kind of comes down to just Whenever I'm, uh, whenever I'm eating or I'm just like chilling, I'll be watching VODs. Uh, practice, on the other hand, we usually like, I don't think, there's not many ways to individually practice. Like you can't really practice your aim in Siege, which I'm pretty disappointed about. Mm. It's what I loved doing in CS, but as a team, we practice strats, we practice running over maps and whatnot, probably three, four times a week. Well, yep. Um, just the difference between trying to be professional compared to your 
the, you know, like, sweaty ranked player. <laughs> it's put, it's putting off, um, other things in your life that, um, to do Siege. Mm. So, say, leading up to Corvette games, whatnot, it'd be, like, four or five hour nights every single night of the week, pretty much all of the weekend, you know, d uh, depends if we're scrimming, if we're stratting, um, or just even um, watching VODs and trying to counter strike what they're doing. Like, it's just, the more time you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. You can tell which teams have practiced and which teams haven't when they do play each other. Hmm. And how do you... F oh, go, Sky. Oh, sorry. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but has uh, Dizzle sort of fallen back into that coaching mani management position, Magnet? Okay, so going back a bit, it was um, after... Losing to, I think, I think it was to one of the, fi one of the finals maybe. Um, I don't know if you hear my dog or not. Let me know. But pretty much, we needed a, a really aggressive um, Ash. I wasn't doing the aggressive Ash. I was sort of doing um, just like a, a supported sort of Ash role, which is not what we, you want at all. Mm. And um, we decided um, we need to pick up another player. Dizzle had a lot of stuff to do. Um, IRL and whatnot, so we decided to get Kings, and uh, with Kings it had to be um, like a package deal sort of thing, so Lusty was there as well, Lusty is just probably one of the most knowledgeable players ANZ, he's been over overseas, he's been everywhere, he knows a lot, so them two on our team brought knowledge, brought aggression, brought great gun skill, um, and then Diz pretty much decided then that the team would be better with them rather than with Dizzle. He stepped back, he's playing sub, he's managing us really well, he's the coach. It's just everything's working out really good for us at the moment with Dizzle playing coach manager sort of role. It's fantastic. So, um, how big of an impact do you think sort of Dizzle has on your gameplay? Does he sort of analyse bots for you or sort of what role does he take in uh, that department, I guess? Uh, Diz, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do the full analysing of um, sort of what other teams are playing, but he's there when we play. He's, um, you know, calming us down. He's giving us ideas. He's, um, he's just playing coach, you know? Oh. I don't know if you know. He's just coaching us. He's been a good coach. If, um, when it comes down to making strats and whatnot, aces is the big, is the big factor there. Oh. But otherwise, it's just sort of a team effort all the time. This is there to just keep us motivated, back us up. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, it's every team's dream to have the perfect lineup that works exactly with the team chemistry you cover all the bases you have that aggressive ash player you have your people who knuckle down and do the strats you have the coach for encouragement and for organization and it takes teams a long time to get there even the teams that have an immense success like continuum they go and they win two seasons and then they change half their roster and then they change half their roster again um mind freak has changed quite a lot of their roster recently just like you were describing what, where do you think the line is between needing to change your roster to make sure you've got the ideal team and getting to the point where you're just going through players and switching things around so fast that you never actually get a chance to settle? I think that mainly comes down to a player's mentality. Um, with a, you know, there's a difference between losing the game, getting you know heated over it and not wanting to put in the effort compared to someone who loses a game they think about what they can do better what happened wrong and they you know put their input in with the team but i think the main thing is just how well you get along with each other that's a big factor to keep your team motivated um i know how many roster changes have we had maybe i think four four roster changes but eventually we got there um we've got really really good lineup at the moment we're confident in all our players and even Diz he does so much background work um just give him time I mean you know what like couple days in the team's not going to do much for you you got to mm. give him time to settle I know a lot of teams um just swap plays left right and center but it just doesn't work like that you gotta gotta give him a chance what are your thoughts Rizrez? I mean your team has kind of been through a couple of changes with the old Corvid A merging with what was mean team six and then everything changing right when the pro league was announced what what are your thoughts on the whole roster change um thing um yeah i i agree with magnet saying that you know roster changes if you roster change too much it's not it's not always good for you i came from a cs background where people used to 
what we call team hop. Mm. So if, some, if, the, if the team's not working for them, they leave a season and find someone new, and they just keep doing that. And um, looking back at that now, those same people never really progressed anywhere. And um, so I've always been a firm believer that if you stick it through, whether your team, if your team's not doing well at the current stage, sometimes just sticking it through can uh, be far more beneficial than leaving. Um, obviously, with the old Corv uh, lineup, I was I was new to the game at that time, mm. and uh, with MT6, I think I was I was on Scylla at the time, and MT6 messaged me, contacted me, and uh, even though I believe like team team hopping isn't the right way to do it. Uh, I decided I'd take the opportunity up, and uh, from that point on, uh, we've stuck. We've like everyone's bonded, everyone's mended together, and we've stuck through thick and thin, and come out on top. So what you're kind of saying is that sometimes changes have to be made, and things have to be done. Obviously, Scylla disbanded because of the the pro league announcements and requirements. Sometimes you've got to just make it a serious change and see how it goes but you have to give it that chance to see how it goes in order to really be able to say, yes, this is this is where we need to be, this is the right decision, and you need to stick through yeah. that. And w what do you think so. about, what kind of advice do you give in terms of that whole thing for new teams or teams that are having, like maybe not necessarily pro league level teams, but entry level teams, teams that are just trying to get their foot in the door and keep playing and they want to improve and they're just they're trying to find the right mix and all this uh for entry level teams you know when if if you have players that aren't mixing well and whatnot on a personal level if you dislike them personally uh, i can see why you can you would get rid of them or why you'd leave but if the team as a whole you know players aren't good that can always be something that you fix as a team so if something isn't working one season, uh, I would never recommend disbanding or leaving. Mm. Just you know, stick it through and see what you can make out of it. So seeing what happened with CTM and Ominous, this isn't the kind of thing that's saying exact, it's exact opposite of what you're saying is the right thing to do, what, what happened with all those teams where they just disbanded when they weren't doing well or they players moved over to more successful teams. and the kind of attitude of an individual player looking to find a spot where they're going to benefit from most rather than saying, okay, here's what I can bring to the table and here's a team that is going to be a home to me. Uh, yeah, well, I just... In that kind of situation, I feel they, they gave more than, like, a season to kind of test waters and stuff. Mm. So if, if stuff isn't working in an amateur team for you know, a season or so, or two seasons or so, rather... Uh, yeah, it's pretty viable for you to try and find someone else with your skills that, that need your skills. But um, yeah, if stuff, say personal level stuff, you just dislike someone, someone dislikes you, uh, you don't get along with players, then I can see why you'd, you'd leave. Fair point. Um. Um, so I guess we've already talked in a brief, like, sort of, push on, like, how do you guys feel about going to LAN? Um, um, I guess another question is, are you guys sort of upping your work, like, like, starting to work, like, a lot harder than usual, not much, or just sort of sticking to what you guys know? You go, Riz. Um, yeah, with us, ever since making the Invitational, we always, we stepped up from there. We made the ANZ Invitational, and we we saw what we could do with ourselves and from that point we put in twice the effort to try and make the the Sydney land and uh, now that we're here we're gonna have to step it up even more to try and make Brazil from here we don't see ourselves slacking we just have to keep stepping up keep working harder what about you Magnet? Magnet. definitely the same as Riz mm. oh. What do, you, what do you think about, I mean, going on after, after the LAN, after all this happens, after this whole season, going into next year, we're going to be having, like, season one, it's always going to be a bit of kind of a trial of what it's like to have a pro league in ANZ. 
next season things are going to be more serious. We know people, teams, and people are going to know what the deal is, and people are going to be upping. It's going to the stakes are going to go go up, and everything is going to get a whole lot more serious. What do you see for your teams going into next year and beyond? The main focus of next year would definitely just be um, invitational qualifications. I know at the moment the top teams from the APEC land will go to qualify for Brazil Pro League. Um, and then cool. from that Brazil Pro League finals, one team will qualify for invitational. But as I said just before, next year um, six invitational qualifications will happen and it'll just be just so much more competitive than what it was just before. Hmm. And what do you think about um, on a domestic level inside the ANZ Pro League next year? Do you think this? How do you think it's going to change for, compared to this season? Much more competitive. Even um, I have no doubt there'll be more, a lot more competitive teams than what it was um, this season. Even with maybe people turning 18 that were really good hmm. before. Um, yeah, a, a lot of teams work a lot harder because yeah. they know that this is going a lot further. For a long time, the, the R6 ANZ scene has been really top heavy, uh, kind of with a, a space in the middle. And we, for so long, we've had well, currently four really, really strong teams, and teams below that have trouble. Even though they're good enough to get into the pro league, they can't break into those top four, and they can't try and get ahead of those. And that level of competition that you think you're saying is going to be coming in next year, I'm I'm incredibly looking forward to that. I yeah, think... definitely. That gap will. Will um will just be so much smaller, I think, and a lot more teams will be over that gap, pretty much of what you went before. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um just the R six Pro League as an as a wider topic? We've we've had quite a few matches this week. Do you, do you guys follow closely all of the EU, NA, and Latin American matches? Chris. Um, I know for a fact. I'm Wildman and uh, the rest of my team do. They follow it a like a lot. They kind of watch it as a religion almost. <laughs> They're on it 24/7. They share strats. They, you know, they have everything. Me personally, I don't follow the EU, mm. NA a whole lot. Seeing I was kind of new yeah. to the scene, I have started now. But yeah, Wild and uh, Fletch and whatnot. Yeah, they follow EU and NA. They they take a lot of notes from there, and they are. Uh, they research them a lot. I feel right now, specifically for ANZ going into that pro league, uh, me personally, I'm using it to kind of you know test waters. If we happen to make Brazil, it'll just be like testing the water. We'll see what NA and EU is like, and then next season, focus on qualifying and then focus on beating them heavy. Mm. Magnet. I think at the moment, heading into the LAN. We won't be able to sort of play how NA and EU play. We'll have to sort of adapt how we play to beat the Asian teams. The strats that the NA and EU teams um, use right now would not beat, say, ERA mm. on um, tied GG. Would say not beat them um, all the time. I, in my personal opinion, there's such a different play style compared to the methodical EU NA that is at the moment. Because yeah. even the, the Latam, they're really strong because of that aggression. They can just overcome all these just side holds and whatnot. And that's why I think we sort of can't just copy exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. going so, in from the, the heavy set meta of, say, um, a EU and NA to teams that play much more unexpectedly and much more freely, it's what, like you said, what gave Latin America their incredible edge and it's why every time i go into casual i get completely destroyed by that guy sitting in that one corner over there who just shouldn't be there it makes no sense but he's just sitting there mm. um people do these unpredictable things when the meta isn't set in stone and north america and eu are so used to this meta being so set in stone and exactly. been, yeah and there's been so much critique of a and z from players from those regions because they say that we don't understand the meta maybe the interaction between our meta and their meta is going to be a lot more interesting and complicated than people think. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I think the best thing to describe is how the NA and EU and LATAM, their attacks are so much more coordinated and that's what really gives them mm. 
uh, what they need to just destroy other teams where our attacks right now, they're not as coordinated as those teams are. But, um, I don't know, defense will be, in uh, even defense will be interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure at the moment. It's just, they've got so much competition over there. They've got um, a lot of teams to scream. They just build the meta so quickly, mm. whereas a smaller community won't. It has a lot more difficulty. Yeah, it definitely does. Mm. Um, which is why we'll have to be working Corvidane and um, us will have to work closely on trying to develop something to really yeah. overcome these strong teams. I mean, you guys can scrim with uh, the Southeast Asia, you can scrim Korean teams, you can scrim Japanese teams with a reasonably acceptable ping. But for NA and EU, there's just such a larger volume of teams that they have the options to scrim and such a larger volume of competitive teams because they can scrim, you know, if they really want, they could scrim Latin America from, from North America. Um, yep. They could scrim EU and NA without having that big a deal of ping. So it's a, a real disadvantage for our region. Yep. Yeah, it's always been like that in um, esports for ANZ, the ANZ region. Uh, I know for a fact Quake and CS, you know, the players that went overseas and whatnot, they really got shell shocked because. Uh, they have no clue. You you don't get to really test what the big the big leagues are like over in NA and EU. You don't you don't get to mm -hmm. really test that. You have to go in blind the first time, and um, that's always been a an issue with ANZ. We don't get that opportunity to scrim some of the higher ups in NA and EU. Mm. How do you think you're Definitely. gonna get around that? Um, for right now, I feel the only option. We can either scrim them on the uh, super high ping and try and learn as much as we can, yeah. or we we try and get to Brazil and we use that as as much practice as we can for the next year. You were saying, Magnet? Like um, with the whole different community sort of thing, after the Mind Freak boys did come back from the Six Invitational, they were just on a whole nother le another level to um, what we were on. The mm. ones who just stayed in ANZ because the NA teams were so aggressive and whatnot. I mean, it's just it's just insane how quickly they can develop strats and all these different stuff. Even just scrumming them would be like uh, the best feeling. Just you learn so much for them. I just feel over the moon. It it sounds like scrumming even with the 250 plus ping is going to be worth it because you're going to learn so much. Yes and no. You definitely got to learn a lot. But just the ping might really affect your gameplay. That's but true. I it, think it'll definitely be worth it. Yeah, it changes the way you play when the peaker's advantage is to such an extent that the, the ping is like that. And and that's sort of also why we can't tell right now if we can beat the Asian teams or not because if we host, we win. If they host, they win. Yeah. But we're still learning different things about different strats. So this land will be really good. Mm. And what's, what is really interesting about when you do actually get a chance to interact with the APAC team or the other APAC regions at LAN, it's going to be the best of those teams. It's, you're not going to be playing the mid-tier Southeast Asian teams. You're just going to be playing the two best Southeast Asian teams. And that's going to be the same when you go, if you manage to get to Brazil and you're playing the North American and European teams, you're not going to be playing the teams that almost made it or the, you know, the, the top six teams in the Pro League, you're going to be playing the top one, the top two of each region, plus some community favourites. And that's just on a whole other level to playing... You're going to be playing the best of the best, and these teams have been around for so long. It's going to be a, a massive challenge. And what kind of an attitude do you have... What kind of attitude can you have that helps you actually push through that? And just... Well, firstly, getting there would feel over the moon, but... Yeah. Um... Definitely, you'd want to go earlier, spend weeks and maybe weeks, even weeks there, maybe just a week, but you'd go there, you'd scrim the crap out of all those teams, you'd learn a lot and just have to, you know, um, let it sink in and adapt really quickly just to play these top American teams. What do you think, Riz? Um, yeah, I completely agree. You gotta go, you know, earlier, you gotta, you gotta prepare for it, but I feel like, me personally especially, is when you, you're playing the best I feel more motivated. If you're playing the best, you learn from the best, and if you happen to beat the best, you're over the moon about it, you're hyped up for the next one and you're ready to go. Hmm. you been running with I... the momentum. Yeah. Cthulhu? 
Um, I just like to say that I'm just in general just excited about the whole land as that is not going to be any of the um, community tournaments. This is going to be the actual big thing and just the giants from all uh, from all the regions will be gliding against them and playing against each other. That will be the like the ultimate pretty much um, showcase of what can ANZ do against other big regions and I'm really curious how this the whole um, the whole LAN event will play out. Everything's will bigger. Be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything's yeah. way bigger. The, even the skill level is bigger. Like you don't expect some of the like casual things that you could even say from um, something over the moon. Um. Um. <laughs> No, I was going to say, even just sort of like going to land for the community aspect, sort of uh, getting together as a community and sort of getting to meet everyone, I think that's going to be a, a pretty cool experience as well. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's yeah. always a good part of land as well, meeting meeting everyone. Actually getting to meet your team that you've been playing with five hours, several nights a week. Actually getting to see them yeah. in person and show them your pink hat. <laughs> Yeah, everyone was super excited to see the pink hat for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you very much everyone who's joined us today on the stream. And thank you very much to our special guests, Magnet from Mindfreak and Rizraz from Corvide. Thanks guys for being no here. Thanks, Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having us. Um, guys. And thank you Cthulhu and Sky for um, co-hosting with me. Everyone's put in a huge amount of effort to, yeah. Everyone's put in a huge amount of effort to make this actually happen. It's kind of insane. Yeah, big thank you to Dev as well. He's uh, probably been, I guess, the main staple. He's put um, a lot of his own time into this. Obviously, developing this whole like, overlay and um, lots of graphic stuff. He's also written the script. So, a uh, big thank you to Dev as well. He's probably, um, as I said before, sort of the staple. Uh, sticking everything together. You made you made the script this week, so you can take credit for that. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we're gonna wrap up now. Um, we're just gonna finish off, and I'll show the highlights video in case you missed it at the start. Um, every week, this is the R Six Z podcast. Every week, we're gonna come back here. Um, time may vary between. Uh, this week, it was on nine p.m. AEDT. In future, it may be 8 p.m. AEDT. We can keep you posted on that. Um, we have a Discord. Um, we'll put it in the Discord URLs inside R6ANZ. You can go and grab it there. We might even put it in the chat. Um, go and come by. Give us some, submit some clips from any of the ESL or CG matches, um, and maybe your clip will make it into the highlights video for next week or future weeks. So, thanks for that. We'll play that video now. Thanks to everyone for co-hosting co and being a special guest. And we'll, we'll see you guys you. next time. See you guys. See ya. see Moogie here going for a bit of a spawn peak. Oh, Moogie! What is that? Finds two onto Neo and Spaz. Athletico are going to hate themselves. And Moogie is going to be in disbelief. Could be possible for Irons, that's for sure. This is going to get open and Proto from above manages to take down no time. It's all going to be on VOD and Cloud at the moment. VOD searching for the planner. Cloud manages to find a row, but that's not the planner, and the bomb should go down at the moment. It does. It's all on Cloud, who gets found by Proto. Proto doing beautiful stuff for his team there, and evening it out to 2-2. From the east, and Nierge will be triggering the very f uh, the first um, Grismo mine. Oba securing the kill on Kennedy. That's Ella down, and one of the aggressive Roma's gone. Oba certainly now paying more attention towards... The generous closet as that will be breached and knights will be caught off guard and Oba will be securing a second kill on Castle, making it a 3v5 situation. LeBron will be potentially forced out and will be caught off guard with that Ash charge. 
as that wall was not fully reinforced and ended up being a double-edged sword for Anthrax. Oh, but going for a very aggressive push at Peekaboo and will be sec um, securing that final kill. It's around, manages to spot them out and he's going to back off there. Magnet finds out Fletch, he's looking for the second. Magnet finds Warden, could this really be possible right now? They're just going to wait it out. Magnet goes for the defuse. Rizra is getting ready to run around here. And he should be the person that denies this. Oh, no way is this going to be possible. Magnet in a 1v1 clutch situation here against Jack Daddy. He has managed to... It's actually a 1v2, sorry. Magnet finds Jack Daddy. Oh my god, that was so close. That was so close there. Clutch has been tagged quite heavy. Lusty's come around to replace Aces in taking. Oh no, right as I say that. Wildman looking to prove me wrong as he finds Magnet, he finds Lusty Wildman going massive at the moment. It's a 3v2 with 25 seconds on the clock. Kings, however, manages to find a kill over onto Rizraz as he's made his way into dining. Being careful of above at the moment, Fletch has been tagged heavy. We're now at 16 seconds on the clock, what's going to happen? It's now a 2v2, Fletch has been tagged heavy, Pun coming above, looking to drop the hatch. He's going to be pre-firing, looking for Wildman, and Wildman finds Pun, ladies and gentlemen. It's looking like Corviday will claim victorious on map number one. Wildman even manages to fight Kings after a beautiful 4K.